All right. Welcome back to uh, what I've been calling the uh, episodes that I do here on this channel. Uh, <laughs> today we have uh, uh, James Chill Goblin. He is from Toronto and uh, he has his own channel on YouTube. We're going to be talking a lot about that. Um, and he also does streaming on Twitch with Sam from This Is Hell. Uh, we're in hell. We're in hell called yeah. Goat and the Goblin. That's right. The Goat and the Goblin. It's the Goat and the Goblin. way too long of a name with too many articles in it. <laughs> you got to get him right in the URL or it won't show up. But yeah, The Goat and the Goblin. And uh, yeah, and uh, as far as introduction goes, you know, I, I don't do a lot. So let's just jump right in. Uh, re Not I right. found out about James uh, because he posted a video that was talking about Michael Malice and... Uh, Michael Malice happens to be kind of the straw that broke the camel's back when it comes to me putting <laughs> out uh, any kind of video content. So, of course, I watched it. It was very good. And then uh, also submitted it to Anarchist News and I uh, got a lot of a lot of feedback even for that website. So. Yeah, I was really like I, blown away. Like there was a, so many comments on it. I saw like. I don't know, like, I, I'm not super familiar with Anarchist News, but I saw like a bunch of other like massive like uh, projects. Like there's like some, I don't know, like Behind the Bastards episode and like uh, other stuff. What was, the, what's the new thing on that, uh, that uh, thing? Cool that, people uh, do things. That's right. Things. Yeah. Cool people do cool things. And like they had some like likes, but they didn't have nearly as many comments. Like for whatever reason, the Michael Malice thing like must have struck a nerve with people and everybody was like chiming in. And uh, yeah, it was very cool. Everybody was very informed. It was, it was no YouTube comment section. This, this is anarchist news. Right. And yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because my assumption is that people are familiar with anarchist news, but that's like a 12 year old assumption by now that so much has changed since then. And uh, I'm starting to realize that a lot of people aren't familiar with it. <laughs> so for anybody watching this who doesn't know, anarchist news has been around since like the mid 2000s uh it was started by this guy aragorn who's passed away his memorial is actually tomorrow unfortunately oh, damn I, yeah won't oh, be able to make it um but uh it's a, a sister project to the anarchist library and the publishing imprint little black cart which uh, is an imprint of uh ardent press or maybe i have that backwards but yeah, they've been around a while. And uh, one of the big things with them is that uh, if you're familiar with InfoShop news. No, uh, I'm not. Okay. They were another uh, actually even older anarchist news resource. Um, that was pretty much the most popular one during the early 2000s and going forward. And then uh, they stopped allowing people to comment on the on the content they put out. And that was like the big breaking point. So Anarchist News became, this is where you could go. It's troll friendly. And, oh, I see. <laughs> and uh, right. yeah, it earned a reputation of being a cross between the biggest cesspool of anarchist comments and also uh, kind of being a really good resource when something is happening live. Mm -hmm. Like if there's an anarchist action and there's live updates happening. So, yeah. So. You kind of like with this, I don't know, like social media or whatever, or like, uh, you know, things where like, like anarchist news is interesting because people can post without an account. Like people can do like almost like a 4chan style. Like you just have to be on the website and comment. So yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a cesspool, but it's also that ease of access is going to make it great for, yeah. Like you said, like covering on the ground in the moment stuff like uh like twitter or whatever and it's got it's pretty legit that it's like i don't know affiliated with uh what is it little black card and uh the anarchist library right yeah pretty respectable online anarchist sites definitely yeah so yeah so anyway uh your your post had well your video had a ton of commentary on it and i was wondering what i mean what did you think of some of the commentary uh i I was actually worried, you know, people would be dicks or something because 
uh, it could go either way on that website, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's all good. I mean, like, I don't know. I'm, I can definitely handle, uh, criticism. I was like a, a stand-up comic for a while. I've been a telemarketer. Like I can deal with rejection. I can deal with people not, uh, not being into my stuff. Um, but most people were like, we're nice. And like, I was getting a lot of, uh, feedback on particularly the definition of anarchy that I used, uh, which I also got a lot of feedback in my YouTube comments, but I just found that like on the website, it was more, uh, generally more of like a robust, like here's what you got wrong and here's why you got it wrong. And here's like the, what you should have said where instead of just being like, you idiot, I can't believe you said this thing that I disagree with. Uh, and I think like a lot of the, uh, you know, um, uh, people a lot of the what's the word corrections were like warranted and uh valid and i learned a lot i usually find like i don't know i'm um i'm not necessarily the most uh intelligent or like well i shouldn't say that i'm a, I'm a smart guy but i'm not the most read up on a lot of subjects i think i'm funnier than a lot of other youtubers but i'm certainly not like uh, i don't have a phd in anything i went to film school so i usually when i make a video on something i post it when i feel like i've done all my research i post it i get a bunch of comments and i'm like oh there were actually a bunch of factual uh, errors in this so when i'm the most knowledgeable about a subject it's like maybe two or three weeks after I've posted the video about it and people are like, actually this, 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 this. So this was definitely no exception to, uh, to those cases. So I was, I was happy to read through those. I got like, I made an account, you know, even though I didn't have to, I made an account so people could tell it was me, chill goblin. And I like went into the comments and I was like, Oh, you thought it I was, uh, this was wrong. What would you, uh, how would you correct them trying to learn here or whatever? Which is also funny, like when people are dicks online, it's really funny to like comment back, but just be like really nice. And then they're almost always just yep. like, oh, uh, sorry, I didn't mean what I said. Um, well, what I was thinking was this. And they'll suddenly be polite. So, yeah, it was uh, it was all good. Well, it's actually useful. I learned a lot from that that comment thread. Yeah. And, and I'm scrolling through it right now. I know you can't see it, but I'm just whizzing yeah. through the it's a long comment section Send i mean me a link back on uh patreon let me see if i could pull that up uh bibbidi boo there it is okay anarchist news yeah um but uh cool website 93 oh. comments <laughs> Those are some real numbers right there right yeah and that you know i could tell you that that's not um, that's unusual today, uh, <laughs> lately for the website to have that much going on with it. So, so what, so what was it about Michael Malice that you decided, uh, obviously, you know, you gave plenty of your reasons in the video, uh, yeah. but you know, there's a lot to choose from. You could have done Coke brothers. You could have done. Sure. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, like the thing about Michael Malice is that he, not a lot of people really know who he is on the left anyway, but, um, if you are a fan of any, like almost any like right wing podcast or even like, you know, Fox news show or the blaze show or whatever, like you have probably seen Michael Malice. So you might even recognize his name because he is everywhere. He pops up everywhere. And uh, he has what I would consider a, a very like dishonest, like disingenuous kind of um, uh, like definition of anarchy that he uses, or uh, perhaps I should I should say he the way he represents himself as an anarchist I would call dishonest and you know um, malicious. Uh, hence the name Michael Malice, maybe. Right, and, and, and oh, so, and that that's something sorry, that came up in the comment section that oh he calls himself an anarchist without adjectives. Mm -hmm. But the other person I know of that calls himself an anarchist without adjectives is this guy, Sean Wilbur, whose website, Libertarian Labyrinth, is very much dedicated to actually talking about anarchism, its history. It's not. Yeah. Like I, I sort of like went a little bit hard on him in the video for calling himself an anarchist without adjectives when he really is an anarcho-capitalist. I think like. If you look at what his beliefs are, it's pretty hard to come to any other conclusion. But um, like that is an actual phrase that people use. Uh, you know, it, like who'd you say it was who, who runs the website? 
that calls himself an anarchist without adjectives? Uh, Sean Wilbur. I'm not sure if that's his current uh, label. He actually <laughs> tends to come up with different ones every couple of years, but yeah. uh, there, like there is, there's actually a whole Wikipedia page about anarchism without adjectives being like a thing. Yeah, um, and I think Volterine Declare was, I know one of the prominent uh, um, early American anarchists to call herself that. Okay, yeah, that that could be the uh, the origin for sure. I mean, I feel like um, I don't know. Like, would that refer to like? I mean, anarchists without adjectives. Is it like, I get that it's kind of annoying how many different types of anarchy there are, or whatever anarchists, anarcho uh, communists, anarcho mutualists, uh, you know, anarcho primitivists, which is another one that's kind of like, bleh, in my opinion. Uh, you know, there's like a bunch of anarcho pacifists, um, anarcha feminists or whatever. There's, there's all kinds of, yeah. And that the historically there's those, there's been less labels, but there always has been a plurality because, uh, as far back as Prudhon, you already had individualists and mutualists. And then mm -hmm. with Kunin, you had collectivism, which basically is a syndicalist, only you know workers running their factories type of thing but it's not quite communist which right you get the kropotkin which is actually having communes with no money and things like that so uh mm -hmm. between the individualists and what might be called the more social anarchists there's always been a little bit of a uh, tension and so that initial um uh urge to use anarchist without adjectives or synthesis is basically saying, okay, the individualists and the communists should get along. It didn't have right. much to do with markets. Right. No, like, and I think that like, honestly, like, um, you know, uh, I know I, we're going to talk about the definition of anarchy uh, a little bit later, but I, I feel like, you know, just being against hierarchies, there are a ton of different types of hierarchies that need to be uh, dismantled in different ways. So it makes sense that there would be like, different strategies, different, you know, groups of people who are, you know, like there's absolutely nothing in my opinion, contradictory about being an anarcho feminist and an anarcho communist or something like that. Like these are just, uh, what are you, cons what hierarchies are we focusing on today in this group? And like, in that sense, I can see, yeah, I'm an anarchist without adjectives. Like, I don't want to say I'm not okay with all, all these other forms of, you know, uh, restructuring society, you know, abolishing hierarchy. Uh, but yeah, you know. for sure. The, a lot of it's a difference in emphasis more than a uh, different in, difference in kind. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, I, I think that the core belief of a lot of the different, you know, anarchists are very compatible, you know, if not the, the exact same. Um, but yeah, uh, I still feel like it, it leaves an opening to, these, you know, anarcho-capitalists, especially who are consciously trying to like appropriate the, this term anarchy and uh, weasel their way in through the, uh, the, the open door that you leave by calling yourself an anarchist without adjectives. Right. Or um, even worse, the nationalist anarchists or national anarchists, which, uh, yeah, if you haven't heard about that, like, like a Nazi, like fascism kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, basically they, uh, they, I, I know that, that there's what is it called the patriotic socialists or, or whatever is like a thing these days in like the US. Oh, they, them. they suck very much but uh anyway okay i i didn't know about the nationalist anarchists but uh just for the name i'm ooh. yeah you could guess what their ideas are about yeah like oh yeah uh you know a federation of communes based on race yeah oh god okay that's Wow, that's even more mask off than I was expecting. I mean, even like the anarcho-capitalists are like, yeah, 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 we agree you should abolish the states and that's it. But if you're like a nationalist anarchist, then like, what the, what are you talking about? Well, yeah, they mean nationalist and uh, so the ethnic nationalist and the primordial oh, good. sense of the, the nation as it originated in the blood of the people. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, God. Lovely group. Lovely cool. group. Cool. <laughs> uh, most cool. of them are white if you're... He wouldn't. <laughs> no way. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> oh, uh, no. Anyway, yeah. So it does, that term uh, does al allow a lot of um, people I would consider enemies to weasel their way into 
uh, anarchist spaces mm-hmm. and uh, do as they as they please. Unfortunately, with a lot of success, that's actually what bothers me so much about Michael Malice's. He's he's, he's doing incredible. very well. Yeah, for himself. Like yeah. he's I don't know. Like I, I made fun of him a lot on the thing, but like. I, I just find it so irritating when he calls himself like I'm probably the world's most foremost anarchist. Like I've seen him call him that like a few times. I like have a clip of him saying that in the video. And like, on the one hand, I'm like, what the fuck? No, you're not. But then I'm also like, although I don't know what other person that calls themselves an anarchist is getting this much like FaceTime in some, you know, I would say like mains, like he's on Fox news, like a lot. And even all these podcasts he's on, they, these are massive podcasts. He's on, he was on, Tim, he's been on Joe Rogan so many goddamn times. He's been on Joe Rogan, like, yeah. I don't even know, like seven or eight times. He right. moved from New York to uh, Austin, Texas. I think that's where Joe Rogan is now. But my theory is Malice moved there because he he's like smart and he was like, oh, I'm going to move just down the street from the studio. And I feel this is just a total theory. I have absolutely no evidence to back this up. But I feel like Joe Rogan, whenever he has somebody cancel, he just knows he can call Michael Malice and Malice will drop everything and sh- roll into the studio like 30 minutes later. Um, and it's been so good for his brand, obviously. Like the fucking Joe Rogan podcast is incredible for a lot of these chuds getting seen and getting whatever. No, absolutely. I mean, he's he's a maker or a macher, as my people call him. A macher. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah uh, Mal- and, and Malice isn't an idiot, unfortunately. He's not, e- he's not. easy to dismiss like... Uh, well, I think Jordan Peterson is an idiot, but yeah, <laughs> most people don't. Um, like, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say Jordan Peterson is like has the same sort of like. Um, uh, I don't know. He like Jordan Peterson has definitely like a massive appeal that makes him like dangerous and worrying. But I wouldn't say he's as I guess calculating in his moves, which I think a brief scroll through his recent Twitter is proof enough of that. Malice is like I think more smart about how he represents himself and how, you know, yeah. how he's he uses chess, the platforms he's on. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get that feeling from him. So is that, so is that the first, uh, first video where you really talk about anarchism? Cause I know on your channel you do, you cover all sorts of really interesting topics and I've watched a lot of it, but yeah, yeah. Thanks. I, um, I do, I have one other video where I talk about anarchy. It's my, uh, second video where I basically, um, talk about the two uh, UK punk bands, the Sex Pistols and Chumbawamba. And I'm like- Right, I wanted to talk- Making them go off each other. Like, who's more punk, Chumbawamba or the Sex Pistols? And like, the idea was, if you don't really know that much about the two bands, you're like, Chumbawamba, the fucking, uh, uh, I get knocked down, get back up again. Those guys, you think they're more punk than the Sex Pistols, the most punk band of all time? What? And then like, I, I, I hopefully the, the idea is as you watch the video, you'll be like, oh, it's actually Chumbawamba is way more punk than Sex Pistols and it's not even close. Yeah. And so I, I, a, oh, a big I, part of that oh. video is where I, I explained that Chumbawamba is like, it's a band. It's also like an anarchist collective and they are like, like legit like anarchists, you know, anarcho-syndicalists and anarcho-communists who uh, have a very like deep understanding of this uh ideology and like put it in their music they where they donate their money to whatever like is uh in line with their beliefs and whereas the sex pistols they don't really seem to have an understanding of what anarchy is at all (laughs) based on like any of their stuff so um yeah 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 that whole video i kind of made as an excuse to talk about anarchy uh but in like a you know interesting clickbaity way there's a documentary actually that just came out uh well uh, within the past year or two called I Get Knocked Down all about Chumbawamba. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen that. I've seen, a, I think, a couple of documentaries about Chumbawamba, but they're older. So that's or maybe cool. Maybe it's called something else. I'm Googling it right now. But I know I just, yeah, the un- untold story of Chumbawamba. There's a Vimeo link. Hell yeah. When I Google it. I'm um, going to that. So one of the funny things about that video about the Sex Pistols versus Chumbawamba is that what was it like a week or two ago when the Queen was having her uh, platinum, the Queen of England Jubilee. had her platinum, uh, what is it, Jubilee? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so John Lydon, Johnny Rotten came out and said, Oh, yeah, I love the Queen. You know, I never, saw, never had like, a problem with her as an individual. Unironically, God save the Queen. It's like, Yeah, I wasn't being sarcastic. 
I really wanted God to save the queen. And I don't know if you saw it, but the Sex Pistols released a commemorative coin for the fucking Jubilee. Oh, God, (laughs) that's so brutal. That sucks. That actually sucks to hear. It's like when uh, the God Save the Queen came out, like originally, there was a whole thing about how that song, it was it was released to coincide with I don't fucking know what the type of jubilee they were having back then was but like in 1977 or 76 or whenever that song came out uh they were also having a big celebration for the royals and they released that song to coincide with that and they had like a big party on a boat where they got too drunk to play but then played anyway and it was like a whole real punk thing and they're like against the queen and they were hoping that song was like going up the ranks and was supposed to hit number one on the pop charts or whatever in uh britain on that same weekend but then there was something weird that happened. And for some reason, the charts that weekend only showed the top songs starting from number two. And it was like, what happened to God Save the Queen? And there was this, all this like controversy about it. And it really did seem uh, quite, you know, counter cultural, anti royal. And uh, to hear Johnny Rotten, like, I mean, he's been walking around in his like Make America Great Again shirts and shit for the last little while. And, you know, being like a pro Brexit for the wrong reasons type guy. And uh, it's not super surprising, but I mean, he's every middle age, like aging punk rockers, like excuse to become a conservative. It's really sad. And yeah, I see these guys all the time, like bars around town. I mean, I live in Arizona, so it's a pretty conservative place to begin with. And Mm -hmm. a lot of uh, punks age into conservatism here. Sad to see. I've I've seen the same thing in you know in Canada, uh, Toronto. Although I feel like punk more than a lot of other like subcultures, it like there on the one hand it's kind of like annoying how gatekeepy punk is, but uh, on the other hand like because you know how people are like oh that's not punk you're not punk whatever, but on the other hand like it sort of prevents it from getting recuperated uh, by you know capitalism. Uh, so much not like entirely and there's been a problem because punk is kind of like angry and it appeals to the youth and it's been uh co-opted by fascists and like nazis and there's been like a whole fucking thing about that but uh there's i don't know i i do see a lot of older punks with uh, who are people who are into like the exploited or whatever and like i don't know i always try to like fucking i don't have much patience for the exploited the guy has like yeah. a swastika tattoo on his oh, well why arm. yeah can't yeah uh but um, um anyway <laughs> that's a different story altogether yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh yeah so that was it was funny to i actually did a video uh, i'm just remembering with uh do you know radical reviewer on youtube uh yeah they do have they have the dog the dog yeah no no yeah. they don't have a dog they are a, the, it's they are a the him. dog that's the dog that's him uh i did a video with him about this actually called uh uh punk the recuperation of punk or something like that um and uh we started we talked about this this kind of thing um talked about some mark fisher capitalist realism type stuff kurt cobain getting you know turned into t-shirt guy who was like a what do you think about mark fisher um Doug Lane from uh, Sublation Media has been, uh, which I think published. Uh, I th- yeah zero they, books yeah zero bo- zero books. He's the zero books guy. Yeah 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 yeah. yeah I feel like like Doug Lane. I've, I've uh, I used to watch some of his stuff. I've like I'm a I'm a zero books reader. I've read a lot of zero book stuff. I feel like the, I don't know. I haven't kept up on this totally. Hasn't Doug Lane had some like weird takes recently about some stuff? Am I getting that? get my wires crossed here uh, i don't know he's, he's definitely joined the uh anti-woke uh, kind so, of yeah, uh, I, I, thing i don't i don't like to see i think i saw him like defending glenn greenwald or something like that i, I don't know exactly what it was but yeah, but, anyway yeah <laughs> I, I don't know exactly what it is but but mark fisher like i really like mark fisher personally uh i don't think he he was perfect i mean like i reread exiting the vampire castle uh recently and he spends a good deal of that um that essay which i still think is valuable and makes a lot of good points but in retrospect reading it now he spends a lot of time like being angry at feminists or just like leftists for um getting angry at russell brand and he's like like right like i didn't remember that but reading it in the light of 2022 where russell brand's like 
oh my god like he's barely better than rogan now but like at the time he said something sexist in like an interview where he was also talking about how he was a communist and how whatever voting is bad or something like and uh, mark fisher's like and the feminists got upset because he said this and it's like oh are we really gonna just be these you know no fun hall monitors whatever obviously i'm not doing a great job of uh, you know, <laughs> paraphrasing it here, but I will say the Russell Brand stuff has not aged well. Um, but uh, uh, no, I well, yeah, he's got, he's got he had a lot of uh, good points to make about the left uh, in that article. I mostly like him for um, I, I quite like his uh, stuff on acid communism and um, you know, obviously capitalist realism is like a, a pretty uh, influential work of modern. I don't know, political theory, I would say. And also very yeah. readable. Very like readable. New, he's like the new Guy de Boer. Yeah. I um I I like particularly the idea um where he's talking about like acid communism and stuff, that he said that if you give yourself a label and you, you, you know, you, you attach this label to your ego, you know, you call yourself like, I'm e even like an anarchist. You're like, I'm an anarcho communist. Like I'm a Kropotkin anarcho communist or whatever. And you attach your ego to that book or that guy. And then you hear somebody who's making critiques of this, you know, this theory, it can cause people to be really defensive and like act like, Oh, I feel like I'm being attacked personally when actually they're making a critique of a book that was written like 150 years ago, like whatever it may be, not just anarchy, obviously, like anything, like, you know, people who call themselves Marxist Leninists, right? Like they, like these are ideas that are open for discussion, for critique. And I think there's like a ton of valid critique of all, you know, the, the main leftist political thinkers. Uh, so, and so I, I liked what he said about that uh, in his, on his blog. It never I'm, got published I'm as a book, I guess. I'm completely unfamiliar with uh, the, this notion of acid communism. What is, is that the premise or what is it? It's, uh, there's a good video by um, uh, One Dime about it. It's, so acid communism was, I believe, the book that he was writing when he uh, passed away. Um, so it was never actually fully completed, but he was publishing it on, like publishing segments of it on his blog. People have done the work to kind of piece it together and like what it was that he was going for. But that particular idea from Mark Fisher, I, I quite like, um, I, I feel like that's been useful for me. I'll have to um, look in, into whatever that is. Cause there's this podcast mm -hmm. I really like called acid horizon and mm, cool. something tells me those two things might be connected. Interesting. Um, yeah. I don't know. What, what do you think about him? Uh, really? I'm only familiar with capitalist realism and, uh, I'm okay with it. I mean, I re I read a lot of stuff like Frederick Jameson mm. or like he totally stole Frederick Jameson's thing there, eh? The right. easier to imagine the end of the world and the end of capitalism. Everyone's like, ah, Mark Fisher said it best. <laughs> yeah, and really, I attribute a lot of this sort of thinking situationist or you know post nineteen sixty eight French thought uh, is where I broadly put a lot of this thinking and it's interesting to see like a, an English take on it actually mm. to bring this back to the sex pistols thing. Sure. One thing that's, that is interesting is their manager, Malcolm McLaren, who right. uh, was a, what what's called a post situ or there he was, he was part of a group called King mob and okay. they were a, a part of the British version of the Situationist International. Yeah, who, I just started reading uh, The Invisibles by Grant Morrison. Have you read that comic? Uh, I've been told I should read it. Oh, yeah? I just started, I, be, I got it recommended by a bunch of people, so I just recently bought it. And there's a character named King Bob, so that's interesting. Oh, that, that probably has a lot to do with it. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, oddly enough, for as much of a prick as uh, McLaren is, uh, for, you know, he, his ideas come from a situationist sort of, which is anarchy, anarchist, right? Well, they're, they're more council communist, but they were, they're against political parties and they oh. were against the, uh, the Marxist Leninists and they were for the student revolts in France and, but their okay. whole thing. Okay. Was that sounds like, good. 
uh, one of their main thinkers was this guy, Guy Debord, or Guy Debord. Right, right. <laughs> and he wrote the book Society of the Spectacle. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Familiar with that one. So this is how it ties into Mark Fisher as well. They, their whole thing was, what do we do about the spectacle? How do, we, how do we take it, mess with it, make sure our stuff doesn't get recuperated uh, to bring it back to the punk thing? And so that's sort of the, that's the, uh, the predecessors to McLaren, which ultimately, uh, you know, comes out through him creating the Sex Pistols. Hmm. So... If you look only at the Sex Pistols, they're this uh, pretty embarrassing boy band who unfortunately wrote <laughs> some good music. Oh, their music's good. I'm never going to say that. Like, I, st- I still listen to their music. I do Anarchy uh, in the UK at like every uh, karaoke night I go to. Yeah, it's, it's, I, for, I love that. I love that album. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but so, but there is uh, behind, them there was some thought put into it by the manager yeah i like i'm always skeptical with with mclaren stuff because it does seem like he would often just kind of like roll with things and then like justify them afterwards be like yeah i meant to i meant it to go like that or whatever right so um did he put the ideas of the you know king mob movement and these sort of like uh well situationist like ideals in the practice with the sex pistols i mean maybe yeah yes uh I, there's there's a book about it which i forget the title but it doesn't matter um it was i'm pretty confident when i say that it was a conscious uh effort to make a cultural phenomenon that would be a, an attack on capitalism okay and the spectacle that would sort of be like a bomb all right yeah he i guess he did sort of like um you ever read about how like the sex pistols kind of like ended like on their tour of america uh he, no he purposely so mclaren booked them like it, they were getting offers because they were like kind of blowing up and they're starting to become big in the U.S. So they were getting offers to do all these kind of like, you know, liberal cities and like stadium shows or whatever. Not, I don't know if stadium, but like big concerts full of people that wanted to see them. And he purposely was like, no, fuck that. I'm going to book them in a bunch of like country Western fucking like festivals and bars and shit in the South oh. where, where everyone hates yeah. them. And he booked them at a bunch of shows like that. He also, they were supposed to be on SNL and they completely didn't i i think it was who was it that went on instead of them like last minute because they've like missed the show or something and it ended up being like i forget like lyle lovett or somebody went on and he was wearing a shirt that said thanks malcolm because they were like oh eh, <laughs> this like opportunity like last minute because of like sex, sex pistols just didn't show up wow and uh, they ended up going on all these tours and people hated that hated them and they were just fucking bombing it was brutal and then on that last famous last show where johnny rotten's like you ever get the feeling you've been cheated uh that was when the band just like broke up because they're like fuck this this sucks. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, probably wasn't that uh, that fun. But maybe that was him trying to be like, "Fuck capitalism! I'm gonna do the opposite of what like a smart capitalist business decision would be." Uh, anyway, he was an interesting guy. Yeah, and a very you know contradictory person. Too. Mm-hmm. I think like, it's fair yeah. to call him a a boy band, but like a pretty chaotic uh, boy band. Uh, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what, so tell, tell me a little bit about your live stream. What do you do with it? Uh, what, a, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I do the live stream with, uh, with Sam from we're in hell. And, uh, we basically, we watch mostly like, uh, videos from, you know, like fascists and conservatives and other chuds and like, just like make fun of them and, uh, pause and play. We watch a lot of conservative rap, uh conservative music oh, there wow. is a really really amazing um thing i watched uh last night on stream uh that's like this anti-gay movement called lmnop that stands for lifestyles of mainstream ordinary normal or mainstream normal ordinary people and uh <laughs> they did a anti-gay musical uh with uh characters playing marjorie taylor green and whatever and like 
it was just, it, it was incredible. Uh, one of the worst things I've ever seen. That's so we watch a lot of like cringy wow. stuff and like make fun of it. Um, yeah. I feel like I have like a pretty high tolerance for that kind of thing. I know like a lot of people can't really <laughs> spend that much time uh, digging into it, but I don't know. Like well, even for, even for that Michael Malice thing, I've uh, maybe you're the same way. I watched so much interviews with the guy. Oh yeah. Um, I have no problem doing that. I actually, that sounds great. I'm definitely going to tune into your <laughs> live streams. Yeah. It's fun. It's fun. Sometimes we just do like, I don't know, like study streams or something or that are less, uh, intense, but it's funny. Like we're both like standard comedians. So we do just like to roast people and whatever, use the, the power of comedy for good, you know, uh, take the fascists down a little bit. Awesome. But, uh, yeah. So how do you, uh, what do you, what do you see the anarchist media, uh, today? What is your read of it? I have a pretty pessimistic view. Uh, it's gotten mm. better since I started looking more into what people are doing with video, but I'd like to yeah. hear your take cause you're in the space and I don't talk to a lot of other people who are. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, I think that, hmm, okay. I've sort of come to the understanding because like I've, I sort of got brought to the left by like Chomsky. That was reading Chomsky is what I would say radicalized me. And I have, which partially why maybe I, I fucked up my definition of anarchy. But uh, anyway, I uh, have always like i've been feeling for a long time like okay like i you know i can get on board with a lot of the stuff the ml say but i feel like anarchism is like the most uh like the best possible just being like against hierarchies that seems like the best way to structure like a leftist like framework of the world and looking at the news with like an anarchist lens or like an anarchist squint is like super helpful and being skeptical of authority and you know tearing down hierarchies and preventing like oppression and exploitation. I feel like anarchy is like the best uh, mode to do that through. However, I do find that I wish there were more anarchists. It feels like there's not really that many outside of, you know, online, Twitter, YouTube, anarchist news, Reddit <clears throat> stuff. And, you know, it's pretty hard to imagine like, I don't know, an anarchist getting like a, John Oliver type show or something or like some kind of mainstream thing just because of what anarchy is. It's not friendly to uh, advertisers and corporations who have historically held the power in media. Um, I think that YouTube and, you know, Twitter and all kinds of like Twitch and all kinds of these like uh, alternative platforms are good for anarchy, for anarchists and anarchist media. Um, that's certainly how I have been able to kind of like watch enough about it, learn enough about it to uh, feel comfortable kind of like identifying with that label and with that sort of movement. I don't know if it's enough though. It's, it's, it'll be interesting to see because while it's good for anarchists, it's also good for everybody else. It's also good for all the, the fascists and everything True. too. Um, so the state of anarchist media right now, I mean, I don't know. Like I, I wasn't really familiar with, um, uh, anarchist news before you, uh, you showed me that site. I wasn't familiar with, uh, I mean, I definitely knew the anarchist library. So where I've found a lot of my stuff to read, they post well, everything for free. That's awesome. Let me, let me put it but, this uh, way. Yeah. What's your take? So, uh, do you, do you know what indie media is or, uh, what it was? So back, anyway, so. Um, well, what do you, like back in the 90s? Yes. Or so? so if we go back to like dot com times before the bubble right. burst, uh, the old pitch from anarchists a lot of the time used to be like, hey, free software, Linux, Wikipedia, mm. indie media, anarchists were involved in all of this digital stuff. And it was right. really, and crypto still meant cryptography back then. It didn't mean <laughs> cryptocurrency. So you had. <clears throat> I think crypto is completely fucked, but like when I first heard about it, I was like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. I like that idea. Yeah. Right. Well, it, and, but there's Things a totally change. different ideology associated with that now. Mm -hmm. uh, all yeah. that stuff used to be associated with anarchism. So uh, basically, if you were like hacker curious or you were 
free stuff curious or food not bombs or whatever there is mm-hmm. just anarchists were really the people who were uh radicalizing uh the next generation it wasn't really marxists because the marxists were still kind of stuck in like uh trying to hand out weird uh maoist magazines and and just they okay. just very conservative worker oriented stuff no one wanted to listen to and <laughs> okay. and you know the soviet union just fell apart recently so okay yeah talking 90s here yeah so when so like basically, okay so like 99 yeah. or so so if you yeah so if you go from then to now uh and you try i mean Anarchists are still very involved in like the free software movement. You know, there's uh, Moxie Marlin Spike, who is behind Signal and uh, Open Whisper Systems is the cryptography that Signal used, stuff like that. There's also is the, is the uh, who is that the CEO of Signal or like the person who designed he, it or something? He, he uh, I think he recently stepped down, but he invented the cryptographic cool. uh, technology that Signal uses. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. I, you know, I'm, I was born in 1989. So I was like a, a child in the the nineties. I definitely wasn't uh, aware of the anarchist scene, but um, from what I understand, wasn't there like, like the computers in general were like a much more like open source, everything's free, share everything. And then like Bill Gates kind of came in and started like e- making everything IP and whatever, like. I could give a that? brief summary. I was born in 85, so I'm not, I'm not a whole lot older. Okay. 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 <laughs> uh, so my, so my internet, uh, uh, my birth into the internet was like AOL time period. And uh, even though what really changed for the internet during my life was when internet stopped being dial up modems and started being broadband cable connections or DSL connections. And the reason why that was such a big deal is because when things were dial up, you could, there is something called freaking, which was like kind of like mm. the phone equivalent of hacking. Right. And you could basically get free f- long distance phone calls or use other people's phone lines. So you could do all these things that made it possible to really not be a part of any centralized internet. But um, once uh, the internet went on cable and the cable TV networks and, you know, instead of the phone companies started dominating it, uh, you really had to, uh, unless you're on public Wi-Fi, which there wasn't a whole lot of, you really were connected to a grid that was dominated by private interests in a way that the pre-internet could get around. Uh, um, hmm. And then if you go back even earlier, kind of the time period you're talking about, uh, you know, people ran bulletin board systems and that's what they dialed into. You would basically call somebody else's computer and uh, sort of like a message board. It was it wasn't synchronous. It was it like alt dot whatever. <clears throat> Say that again. Uh, was that like the alt dot, like whatever, those old message boards? No, no. I mean, uh, I think some of them, yeah. But it was a whole different kind of technology. And okay, gotcha. So anyone Would who you say had, that was better for anarchist media back then? or uh, there, there were things better about the uh, a truly decentralized internet. Mm. Um, that now everything... So what the problem is now, yes, YouTube, yes, Google, all these are big corporations that own them and mine our data and do all these things. Uh, That doesn't stop anybody from making alternatives. The real thing that stops the alternatives from being successful is how much it costs to maintain the technological infrastructure. So the demand for streaming video and things like that. And getting people to adopt the technology. People are super stubborn. And Facebook, I think, is really uh, the first time I've seen that kind of stubbornness happen because they finally got all the old people to mix in with the young people. And just getting any... any well, the young people left. Yeah, yes. But 
yeah, having having competition is hard. I like get Discord, I guess, is doing okay, but yeah. Yeah, Discord's cool. So anyway, long story short, what I'm saying is that anarchists used to have be at kind of the forefront of technological innovation. Uh, and they were they were creating a lot of the alternatives that were popular. And now it's so hard to build those alternatives and the people at the forefront of technology are like Elon Musk or these big capitalists. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, the, the web used to be more, I guess, like uh, open and available in that like, uh, I don't know the ro romantic uh, romanticized picture of like cyberpunk, you know, anarchist hackers is sort of like been replaced by the like tech billionaire CEO genius uh, that like is doing all his own coding. Right. So the startup billionaire. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's not good. Uh, it's not good. How, how that happens. Um, yeah. No capitalism uh, recuperates things. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's what it does best. Yeah, but, um, yeah. I don't know. Like, what what would be your your uh, like like? Do you feel like the way that the anarchist uh, media is right now? Like, I don't even really know. Like, what do we mean by anarchist media? Just like anyone who posts anarchist stuff online? Like, yeah, on yeah. I, I'm I'm willing to be really general with that. Uh, yeah. So if you look at, I mean, you know, it seems like a lot, but there's really only a handful of platforms that people pay attention to Twitter, Twitch, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. YouTube, uh, you know, Facebook or whatever. Yeah. Discord, Discord I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And if you look at, you know, I guess do like sort of like what, you know, what percentage of that market share is made up of anarchists or something like that, you know, what, how, how much influence does anarchist thought have in those spaces? I think it does better in some than others. There was, you know, during the whole Arab Spring. Uh, right. Facebook was period. what? Yeah. yeah. Well, and Twitter, uh, the whole, mm. you know, the ability to coordinate, you know, all of these radical street actions through, through those platforms was really unique, but yeah, I don't know. Since since that time period, I think it's really uh, dived down mm. and never really put my finger on why. I don't. Uh, interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, that would be good to figure out, I guess. Uh, but I don't know either. I mean, like obviously, like an anarchy as a concept is very threatening to uh, powerful people. I think that like there's been there's just like a general kind of like anti-communist sort of um you know propaganda that you just see everywhere uh and with anarchists it's mostly just like oh well anarchy is just chaos and disorder and it's horrible whatever oh my god can you imagine if we abolished the police and didn't change anything else about society oh my god that would be horrible that's what the anarchists want yeah but, uh, i'm yeah i'm not i'm not sure like in in some ways i feel like like i do notice like i mentioned this in in my video uh recently but i do notice that like a lot of anarchists kind of like ideas are pretty broadly like popular and agreeable to people but as soon as they they hear that it's like oh that's an anarchist thing okay wait a second that's scary that's yeah, scary. That, that's that is interesting too because you're you're right. A lot of uh, non-anarchists or people who would not associate it with that term are definitely embracing those ideas. And I remember when I was a kid, you couldn't even say the word capitalism. It was like unthinkable to even name the system that we live in, let alone denounce it. For a lot of people, it's it's still like that, you know. It's like the the water you swim in, or whatever. It's like a fish trying to figure out what water is. Yeah, that's that's true too. One of the things I think happened uh, during this recent time period is I think I think the anti-fa movement took up a lot of energy. 
that. Yeah. How do you feel about Antifa? Like, I know like a lot of, there's a, some anarchists who are like, oh, this was just a gift to the right. Like Chomsky, I think has said that and um, whatever. But I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like they've done successful, good things. It's just that they've also become a, whatever, like scapegoat for everything for the right as well. It's I have a lot of mixed opinions about it because I, um, going back to the punk thing, I come from uh, a subculture that had anti-racist action and had like sharp skinheads and okay. a lot of like fighting with Nazis. And there you go. Yeah. So we were talking about before. Yeah. And um, to me, a lot of it looks like that under a different name. Uh, so the Proud Boys to me are just sort of like contemporary uh neo-nazis yeah basically and a lot of anti-fascist stuff is seems a lot like what ara was doing anti-racist action i don't know if i think ara was also in canada yeah um, I, I, I think so definitely sharps are oh yeah in here yeah um so that part of it uh no real surprise to me um one thing is or you, would you say you were like like, did, do you think that the Sharps or ARA, like they did harm to the movement or like, where, was it overall like a good thing? Like what? Um, so that, that even complicates it even more because <laughs> they were, for the most part, they were not nice people. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, it wasn't necessarily uh, pleasant to have them at punk shows. Even, right. Uh, until the Nazis showed up, you know, they weren't like the most jolly convivial types to have around. They would basically be getting in fights with the punk rockers in the mosh pit and like being homophobic or, you know, oh, really patriotic. Well, that sucks. And, but when the Nazis showed up, they were definitely the ones to make sure that the Nazis can stay. So okay. good to have around in that case, I guess. Yeah. So uh, very mixed uh, feelings about it. Um, and of course that that's, not a law. They didn't have to be that way. There's plenty that were against homophobia and, you know, yeah. there's even uh, red skinheads or rash who were red and anarchist skinheads. So the, that whole subculture. Rash. Right? That's what yeah. they call themselves. That's hilarious. Yeah. Was, yeah. Probably like eight of them, but <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. they were, they, they existed. Um, but, uh, even during that time, I thought it was good for anarchists to fight against fascists as anarchists and not necessarily yeah. as Antifa or as ARA, but actually mm -hmm. to represent anarchism as or anarchists as a fighting force against fascism. Now, is it a gift to the right? Um, I think one of the things that changed is the media used to basically black out uh, coverage of street protests and actions on the street. Their strategy used to be silence about things like that. And uh, ever since Occupy, their strategy has been, um, uh, they definitely cover all that stuff now. Mm. So I don't know. I, I don't, the right wing has been building for a long time and uh, they've always been militant, at least the extreme right. They've had militias and uh, Second Amendment. I'm talking about the United States here, but Second Amendment fundamentalist kind of violent uh, um, subcultures. So, yeah, yeah, it's really hard to say. What do you think? Yeah, I guess. Um, well, I don't know. I can I can see both sides of the argument, but I also feel like, uh, well, number one, like as far as them being like a gift to the right, like they're used like a lot. They're a good like boogeyman for like you know the right to use to act like they're like just worried about people's safety. Uh, when Antifa is like you know when they are violent it's in response to like fascists who are being more violent and like they're not nearly as uh you know dangerous and violent as a bunch of like 
as any given, you know, white supremacist group or the Proud Boys or Three Percenters or, you know, whoever else you want to name on the right. Uh, so it really is like a completely ridiculous, uh, you know, I, in my opinion, thing. I think that like, no matter what, they'd be looking at, they'd find someone else to scapegoat if it wasn't Antifa. I have seen like, I, I mean, uh, it, Charlottesville, for example, or like Richard Spencer, like, you know, Charlottesville, they had that Unite the Right protest. And then the reason there hasn't been any other protests, as far as I can tell, is because of Antifa, like uh, people being like, yeah, we're going to like show up and make sure that there's no Nazis marching in the street. That's that's fucked. We're not going to let that happen. And yeah. yeah, like every ever since then, they tried to do one like a year afterwards and like almost nobody showed up and like way more Antifa showed up. And like, and then like Richard Spencer has said, like he said, like, I'm afraid to go out because of Antifa. And like this guy's like, it, he was a hugely influential Nazi. Like, uh, you know, he's the guy who coined the term alt-right, I believe. And it was like, you know, hugely, but the reason why he's, he, you don't see that much of him anymore is because of Antifa, because of like, people who are like, oh, Richard Spencer's showing up here. We're going to fucking protest. We're going to like do this. We're going to do that. And I mean, like, you know, historically anarchists, you know, if we, you start looking into anarchist history or whatever, uh, a lot more militant back in the day, like the, the bomb throwing anarchists, the propaganda of the deed or whatever, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I feel like there's some times where, uh, Anger is like justified and maybe necessary to uh, have goals done. I've done I'm not, I don't want to be like advocating violence on uh, on your show or anything, but I um, I don't know. I personally I am not against Antifa. I mean, it, it's also like not even a official like organization or whatever. It's like a you know loosely yeah. connected. Uh, meme <laughs> meme yeah that's yeah that's pretty much what it is um but yeah i don't know i'm glad there are people like protecting vulnerable communities from fascist violence and uh i also think it's like interesting that everybody calls it antifa because that sort of disconnects it from what it actually is like anti-fascist anti-fascism it's easier to say you're against antifa than you're like opposed to anti-fascism um so yeah, I don't know. I'm, uh, I, I guess like I can understand that because it's used like everywhere. It was always like a, it's been so many different things to the right. It, it has been useful to them. Like you'll hear them like when people don't want to be like, oh, I'm against BLM or whatever. They'll they'll instead say Antifa, even yeah. if it has nothing to do with Antifa. It's if it's if, if it's part of the movement for Black Lives protest, but somebody doesn't want to seem racist, they know they can just say Antifa. Yeah, know? and. You know, the, I think the right is so media savvy and sophisticated now yeah. that it's really hard to compare to earlier times. Uh, anarchists mm -hmm. have debated propaganda by the deed since it, since it, since it was uh, yeah. Yeah, first proposed, yeah. And I'm sure Chomsky would point out the same things about anarchists in the past as he would about Antifa. Um, the, uh, that, you know, for instance, Berkman, uh, when he shot Frick, the, uh, the steel magnet or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. He's like a shitty, like anti-union yes. steel. Yeah. Really um, like capitalist. basically the whole union, um, that, uh, he was attacking fell apart after that. Like it, all, it, it, uh, yeah. that caused so much controversy that it just like, sucked popular support out of the uh the uh, out of support for labor right so so that that was a a bad idea we can say conclusively yeah <laughs> in it's almost i think my opinion is something like militant action seems like it's best when it's not public mm. <laughs> yeah um and yeah, uh, I think that's, where, I think that's ultimately where I stand on it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting. I, I, I uh, recently read uh, how to blow up a pipeline. Have you read that or familiar with that? It's like a, it's, it's a book about like climate change. And basically it's like, it's asking this question about how like almost every like 
movement has had some people doing violence in it, like any like leftist, whatever, like civil rights or right. any, any kind of movement has had some sort of violent arm or like wing. Absolutely. Um, but the modern like climate movement, that's like climate justice, you know, anti like oil, fossil fuels, whatever. This is, is sort of an exception, like a unprecedented exception to this where there's, where it's, uh, there's no violence. Like everyone is like, very much on the same page. We need to be fully peaceful. Well, you know why? Why, why would you say? Because there was an extreme crackdown on the green, uh, the green, it was called the green scare uh, after 9-11. Mm. Um, not oh. only did they go, not only was the Patriot Act used and like, uh, uh, what, what are those trials called where they're like basically held in secret? Um, Oh, um, I'm not sure what the name is, but yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, during like the Bush uh, era, like, yeah. So Patriot Act stuff. Earth First, Earth Liberation Front, all of like right. the direct action groups that would do things like spike trees so that loggers would hit like these metal pieces in the tree and break their instruments, mm -hmm. you know, technically potentially getting hurt, but I don't think that really happened much. Yeah. Uh, anyway, there was a huge crackdown on direct action groups related to environmentalism mm -hmm. that um, those trials were so vicious and tied up resources of the environmental movement so thoroughly that uh, it's been avoided since. Let me see if I could pull that up real quick. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I believe he, he actually talks, he definitely talks about Earth Liberation Front and uh, what was the other one you mentioned there? I, I believe he, he, Earth he first. yeah, Earth first. Yeah. I believe he, he brings them both up. Um, it's, it's interesting though. He's, he, he sort of, uh, makes a bunch of comparisons throughout history. Like he talks about the Indian independence movement with Gandhi and how everyone considers that like a, a great example of like peaceful protest, but it actually wasn't fully peaceful. And like they, part of what they were doing was, uh, uh, like volunteering to fight with India in the army and stuff like that. And it wasn't like a fully pacifist movement. And then um, he talks about the civil rights era, where, which is another one where people are like, well, Martin Luther King was fully peaceful and like he was not at all violent and he got what he wanted, which first of all, not, he didn't get everything he wanted. He got like some, some change was made, but um, also like a huge amount of that progress that was made by this like peaceful arm of the movement what couldn't have been achieved without uh, a parallel, you know, violent arm with your, you know, uh, Malcolm X's, your Black Panther uh, Party, uh, people who weren't strictly pacifist. Um, right. It, put, it puts them into a choose the lesser of two evils situation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And like after Martin Luther King died, there were like violent protests. There was, you know people were like, okay, you know what? These peaceful guys look pretty reasonable now. Let's maybe like give them some things that they want, you know? Like, so it's, it's, it, I don't know. I don't think it's like um, fully, uh, you know, I, I definitely think like peaceful movements are good and they're, they're necessary and they are typically the thing that ends up going through. But um, yeah, I'm not convinced that there's never a time for uh for violent, uh, whatever. And when it comes to like violence versus people versus violence against property, you know, property damage, like, like oh. this book, how to blow up a pipeline. It's like right. you blow up a pipeline and you don't need to hurt anybody doing that. Right. Uh, you can attack like a oil refinery or something. You can attack the, the means of production or, or Unfortunately, whatever. Unfortunately, the, uh, the opposition very easily just makes people, you know, agree that violence is violence or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's a conflation of these two types of violence. Yeah, that, uh, oh, that that Starbucks window is definitely. Oh, yeah, that you killed that window. That window <laughs> suffered. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's your like Cal Rittenhouse thing, like going to like a different state to protect the fucking like I don't know, like Seven Eleven or whatever it was, Piggly Wiggly, it was or like whatever. a car dealership or something. Yeah, then, so then he, he, well, yeah. He doesn't even know the guy that like owns it. He does, he's never been there. He's just like, it's property and it must be protected. Yeah. Apparently nobody knows what insurance is either. Yeah. Like somehow that, that, you know, that whole 
idea that you know people have insurance on their assets <laughs> yeah <laughs> Whatever. yeah uh Very yeah i think anyway i don't know there, though, this definitely. is all, all in all in minecraft it's all it's all in uh stardew <laughs> valley or whatever i'm not uh <laughs> you gotta be careful with these things okay i'm not gonna not advocating violence no so but i recommend that book though uh to anybody watching how to blow up a pipeline it's very interesting all right i'll definitely link that in the description so we got this uh what is it uh that we have pulled up on the screen to watch stuff? oh yeah do you want to ch check out the my video yeah let's yeah let's throw something up there and hell yeah check that out okay i know i sent you the thing but i forgot where i put it hang on here it is so yeah, um, so this is the video that uh, that you watched that sort of like, uh, I don't know, sparked your interest in my channel. Um, uh, yeah, Michael Malice is, he's an interesting guy, but he's kind of like a lesser known chud on the, uh, on the left. Um, do you want to uh, watch the part um, about where I sort of go on the tangent where I define anarchy? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This, this, this will be cool. Video is great. I mean, so thanks. Yeah. I, uh, I, I put a lot of work into the, the editing process. I try to make it, uh, you know, visually, uh, interesting, but, um, yeah, this, so this, the part that I got the most, most pushback on and yeah, I would definitely appreciate your, your feedback or your kind of like uh, take on my, uh, uh, 101 intro to anarchy here. Um, but, uh, was, was this part here? So let's, uh, let's go over it. Shall we? Um, here we go. Together. Anarchism and anarcho-capitalism. A crash course. Anarchy can sound pretty scary if you're new to it, which is why I'm recommending anarchists uh, lose that spooky jagged circle A in favor of a more pleasant symbol like this little fella, Narchi, the anarchist narwhal. They're just a cute little long-toothed whale that loves sharing with their friends, making sure everyone's concerns are heard, and yes, sure, maybe sometimes, when it's necessary, putting on a black mask and lighting a cop car on. What is anarchy? Well, well, anarchy is a tough concept to boil down, but very basically, you can think. Yeah, so wait, just gonna pause it there for a second. Like, yeah. uh, that's kind of relevant to what we were just talking about, where I think a lot of people are like afraid of anarchist violence. And I, that's one of the reasons why anarchy has like a bad name is like the idea of like, well, anarchists are gonna throw Molotov cocktails or whatever. Uh, and like the, the world that anarchists want to create, I think is like very peaceful and you know egalitarian and uh great and people can get on board with that idea but um in order to get there it may take some sort of form of of uh force to to create uh but and it's easy to be against that like that's an understandable reaction however like the, the world that is, exists right now in this extremely hierarchical way is producing and conducting violence on people constantly, like all the time. So by, by not, uh, you know, creating this world, it's, it's also violent. Yeah. Viol violence is kind of inescapable in a, yeah. a construction. You know, what summed it up for me was when, uh, during something to do with Trump, I don't even remember which thing it was in response to, but, um, Trump said Antifa is coming to the suburbs or BLM is coming to the suburbs. And to me, that's, that's the violence they're afraid of is in the suburbs. Right. The rich white or, you know, suburb, suburban, uh, white people being like, Oh no, they're going to attack me. I don't own the means of production. You mean the manicured, the manicured lawn might, <laughs> might get a divot in it. <laughs> What will my homeowners association say if someone spray paints an A on my garage? They're uh, going to get into the clubhouse? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Think of it as being against any and all unjust hierarchies. The okay, so that's, where I, that's where I fucked up. Unjustified hierarchies. So I've been like thinking about this a lot and I got a lot of feedback on that phrase. Yeah. Uh, unjustified hierarchies. And it's been pointed out to me and it's, it's true. Like everyone's against unjustified hierarchies. Everyone's against like unjustified anything. So by leaving the door open for justified hierarchies, like you could technically, as far as that 
is if that's your definition of anarchy, you could even say like, you know, the Nazis were anarchists because they were wanted a very hierarchical world, like a racially hierarchical, you know, patriarchal, like just incredibly terrible, the most opposite of anarchists world possible, but their hierarchies were justified in their minds. So yeah. So that's, that's where that kind of uh, definition falls apart. Yeah. Unjustified hierarchies. And you know, I wouldn't, it, it's not the best definition, but there's a lot of really bad definitions. <laughs> um, yeah, there are. You know, if you go with saying, well, it's, it's uh, against the state, you know, well, what is the state? Most people don't really differentiate yeah, government that's another hard thing from to define. the state. Yeah. What are we, is that the military? What parts of the state? Is it all one thing? So you get into all these complexities there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the first big anarchist book was called What is Property? Well, that's not a, it's a question about economics. So, right. Anar so, but if you say anarchists are anti capitalists, well, so are fascists. So are, so are communists, you know? So, it's just, it's not, you know, and it's anarchists go through so many different domains and critique them. You know, they're mm -hmm. not just limited to the economic domain or the political domain. There's the family structure. There's right interpersonal relationships, psychology, you know. Right. Yeah. Like, I think like the, so where I got this phrasing from, uh, Chomsky talked about the unjustified hierarchies and sort of gives us his example, like a parent over a child or like a teacher over a classroom or something like that as being like a justified hierarchy. But um, there's like a, a lot of people have pointed out and there's a, a whole thing about like youth liberation that there is actually no reason why a parent should have authority or like a hierarchy over their child. They didn't like earn that. A lot of parents are abusive and a lot of parents, you know, like, like right now we've seen like all these, um, trans kids who their parents are completely blocking them from receiving the, you know, life saving care or not being, uh, supportive at all in their, you know, journeys. And, um, yeah, which sort of like throws the idea of the parent child relationship being a justified hierarchy into question. Um, right. Not to mention there's, there's, uh, societies that raise children communally. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the nuclear family idea is like, it's like more recent than um, I think it to uh, people often realize. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I thought, I think it's like a, a difficult kind of like question to answer as like, far as like, how far do you take the, there's all, all this, like, I don't know, like Twitter discourse. I don't know if you remember, like, I think it was like last year, there's a whole big argument about like, bedtimes like are you for the abolition of bedtimes or whatever like people what? would like no yeah. i've never heard about that <laughs> like like you know there's a lot of people who are like okay if you think a child should have a bedtime you you're not an anarchist you're a statist or whatever <laughs> like uh guys pretty silly i i would say i just think that like these are all like interesting questions and you know anarchy isn't like uh something that you can kind of flip a switch and hierarchies are all gone maybe a better definition would be like uh, the the dismantling of a, all hierarchies or like as many hierarchies as possible and like the, a continuous strive towards uh, creating a fully horizontally structured uh, society rather than like saying that there could be a justified hierarchy. Um, yeah, I mean, my approach, you know, when I define it, I define it as an ethics and... Uh, I define it as the ethics of valuing the freedom of the other person. Um, ah, yep. And I like that. the reason why I've come to define it that way is because in liberal thought, the freedom of the individual is at the center of it already. Uh, and when you get into conversations with people about anarchism, a lot of the time they use the other person and the other person's potential crimes as the reason why we need authority. Nobody wants authority over themselves. They don't think they're gonna be going to jail. Everyone True. wants the cops around 
to to keep them safe from the other person. So that's why I say anarchism is about the freedom of the other person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah, I like that one. Um, yeah, I, if I could if I could go back and do this video again, I'd take out the the word justified. I think talking about hierarchies is a good way to like introduce people to the idea of anarchy and yeah. saying like the abolition of as, as many hierarchies as possible, maybe. Um, I, it, I, it's workable. It works. It's, it's, I, some, it's something close. I, I've also heard, you know, Thought Slime? No. No? Oh, really? Oh, you got to check out Thought Slime stuff. You, you'd love it. Um, is it podcast or YouTube? Uh, YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, YouTuber. And uh, like very, it's like very, he's, he's super anarchist. A uh, lot of great, intro anarchy 101 videos um he's like the one of my biggest influences as as a youtuber and i uh um have i've seen like all of his stuff i uh, uh learned a lot about anarchy from watching him and uh, i've i saw him say once i think it was like on twitter or something i don't think it was in a video but he was saying that like talking about these unjustified hierarchies and he's saying i think maybe a better way is saying that authority does not justify itself or like hierarchies do not justify like they, they are not self-justifying, like just the fact that there is an authority, that's not enough. There has to be some sort of like agreement by people like, okay, we're going to listen to, to this person on this or something like that. Like there has to be a, a voluntary sort of thing. I don't know. I, I might be putting words in, in their mouth, but something uh, like that seemed better to me. The problem people, anarchists tend to run into when they go down this rabbit hole is they, uh, it's really hard to tell the difference uh, between what an anarchist is saying and what some of the original liberal thinkers were saying about freedom and hierarchies and things right. like that. We know what the liberals did with slavery and uh, their value of property eventually leading to capitalism. But before the Industrial Revolution, it didn't necessarily seem like this crazy unequal system was going to come out of liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of the Republic, you know, was supposed to be an idea, basically a voluntary association where you elected representatives and you had checks and balances on, on these different uh, um, functions of governmental power and this and that. So a lot of people respond to anarchists and say, well, that's what we have. This is the result of that. And it's like, well, you got to figure out where that, what that difference is. And to me, oddly enough, I think it is the, it's about what do you do with industrial technology? What do you do with mm. property like that, that is needed by everybody in society, land for agriculture, industrial machines for mass producing whatever mm -hmm. we mass produce like, like medi medicine and, and things for people who need it yeah and i think it's how do you um administer the use and distribution of those things and i think a lot of the other social issues kind of follow from there because if you're going to say there needs to be a equal access or democratic access or something like that to those things. You're also implying that the other hierarchies that exist, sexism, racism, you know, those violate that equality principle. So, uh, and that's what's very different from liberal theory because liberals ultimately don't care if that stuff is privately owned and exclusive. Right. Yeah. I mean, you mean liberal, like the, uh, like traditional. Kind yeah. Of yeah. So I mean, free market. To, well, I mean, compared to like aristocracy. <laughs> gotcha. 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 Yeah. I don't mean compared to conservatives. Yeah. 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 God, these terms are so confusing. <laughs> There's like so many different definitions, but, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I got, I gotcha. And I feel like with like, with capitalism, it's, I mean, with, to use the like liberal versus conservative kind of definition or, uh, um, you know, Democrat versus Republican in, in the U S sort of, uh, Overton window. Uh, it's one reason why like communists or I, I use communism as like, maybe like a, an umbrella term that includes like MLs and anarchists. Uh, but, um, 
I guess just like leftists, I could say, anti-capitalists on the left are able to like the one thing that you mentioned this earlier about how like fascists are like anti-capitalists, which I feel like fascists are fascists are definitely able to critique capitalism in a way that uh, liberals and conservatives aren't. And that's what makes them like very appealing to to some people is that like capitalism like crushes people like under its boot and like people are like justifiably upset about their life circumstances. And, like a fascist comes along and is like, oh, are you upset about like the way that these elites are whatever, like exploiting you? And like they start from a very real place that's like grounded in, in reality. And then where they take it is completely fucked up and i would say like not necessarily anti-capitalist even as much as it's like anti whatever the i don't know scapegoat so, is that they've they've picked here when i say that this is i'm i'm thinking of something pretty specific it actually oh, yeah. ties into something big that just happened today in the united states which is the yeah. overturning of roe versus wade right when i say yeah. conservative or fascists are anti-capitalist I mean, they're against what the markets do to basically to traditional Christian culture. They're upset mm. about commodities and gambling and Las Vegas oh, and Hollywood. Degenerates. Yeah. Like that the whole thing. Yeah. And that's their critique of capitalism, that it destroys that, that family, pure, God-given. Mm -hmm. And like life. as society becomes more you know, open-minded, like the, the gay kiss or whatever in like the latest Pixar movie. That's like a less than a second long, like peck, like not even a, no tongue. And they, they're like, uh, yeah. this is a downfall of society. Western society crumbles. Exactly. And, and so during, you know, uh, when in the 20th century, when the fascists would be talking about this stuff, you know, that's where the Jewish conspiracy was. They're destroying, they're trying to destroy good Christian Europe civilization mm -hmm. through capitalism or Bolshevism. But yeah, it's a, yeah. they really are. Uh, Judeo-Bolshevism well, as the Nazis would call it. Yeah. The best, the best Bolshevism. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, sorry, sorry. Go, go ahead. Uh, you go ahead. I, I was, yeah, I was just thinking like, I mean, you know, the Nazis, you know, they called themselves socialists and you get like the, all these idiots that are saying like, oh, they're, they were leftists actually. The Nazis were on the left. And, uh, and we, we've seen how fascists just co-opt like anything that's popular, uh, from punk music to Pepe the Frog or whatever. Um, and, uh, like the, you know, people will point to, well, they seized all this property from people. That's like a communist thing, but they seized like property from Jewish people and they privatized. Like, I believe that the term privatization is originated to describe what the Nazis did in Nazi Germany. Like that, that is a profet that's like a capitalist uh, thing. Like they are on all the like Nazis at the top got extremely rich. It was uh, like, uh, very compatible with capitalism. I've heard people describe oh, yeah. fascism as like the the last, like the dying gasp of capitalism or something like that. Like the, yeah, the that, last resort to save capitalism is fascism. That's also true. Yeah. Um, it's like uh, fascists are just like completely dishonest about what their intentions are. Basically. <laughs> yeah. Basically that. Their, their ideology is completely fucked. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Um, my, my, general reading of you know the the project of unifying germany under a new reich it, the whole thing is just about creating a german nationality right i don't know mm. it's so complicated unfortunately but there is the anti-capitalist part then then there is you know there's the uh, the split in the nazi party between what was it the straw strasserites yeah strasserites yeah. and I guess what the more pro-capitalist Hitlerites, yeah. <laughs> all the all these like idiot leftists that are like, uh, yeah, no, but th they're they're socialists though. Let's just go with let's just go let's go with them. Yep, that's embarrassing. What a mess. Um. Yeah. Anyway, 
uh, sorry, I don't know. I, I don't really know how we got we got on here, but that no, no it's, it's very interesting. Um, fascism, well, super interesting topic. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why we got there either. What, <laughs> sorry, so my bad. What's, what's what's the deal with abortion in Canada? How is oh, um, well, I believe it's uh, we it's legal. I, I I don't know. I saw somebody post the other day that like abortion isn't legal in New Brunswick or something like that. Uh, or maybe there's like some people in New Brunswick who can't get it, but I don't know. We are, we pride ourselves up here in Canada just, uh, on being slightly better than the U S like our, our, basically our national slogan might as well be like, well, at least we're not the U S heard that so many fucking times. Like every, every single time we uh, shit sucks here. We're like, well, it's not as bad as the U S I, uh, I don't know. It's very, um, very interesting. Yeah, New Brunswick. So apparently, uh, okay. Oh, maybe not. I don't know. Um, I should know more about this. I just assumed that it was like totally fine everywhere. We've got like uh, our socialized uh, healthcare as well. So you, you're not going to be uh, paying money for it. Um, it's better than the US, but I don't know. It still sucks up here. We've got well, our own trucker convoys and stuff. Right. Yeah, man. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. I think tonight is going to be an interesting night. You know, it's still, well, yeah. it's, it's nighttime on the East Coast, but yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Shit's definitely about to go down one way or another. Yeah. It's hard to imagine it not. <laughs> it's, mm. Yeah. This is, yeah, the, the 24th. This is the day that the the ruling officially came down. Yeah. We've known yeah. about it for months. Yeah, it got leaked. That was, that was wild. And then they're, they're trying to pass like harsher anti-leaking measurements as well. I love all the the like people who got upset about that. They were like, this is an outrage. Someone leaked it. And it was like, that's the outrage? It's oh, amazing, man. the gymnastics. How about the yeah. fact that the democracy is broken? That seems like yeah. a uh, is it worse. Oh, and then they'll they'll just say, "Oh, we know that Trump Trump should be president." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, true. yeah. Oh my God, ridiculous. Um, well, yeah. Let's. Uh, we're we're about an hour and a half in. You got a video you want to ride us out with? Oh, uh, sure. Um, wait, let me think. What should I do? Uh, yeah. You want me to like throw something on here? Um, let me see. What do I got here? Sorry. I, I'm so, uh, like, uh, ADHD. I just like, we watched like literally one second of that video. <laughs> I just like got onto a thing. That's but, right. um, let me see here. Um, I was watching the CIA one earlier actually. And I saw the cat thing and then I was watching it with my wife and she just, <laughs> she couldn't believe that that was true. Yeah. Have you ever heard of that operation? No. Uh, Acoustic Kitty. Yeah, no. That, that one is, is yeah. CIA. Oh my God. That is actually what, uh, what radicalized me is like reading about the CIA and like, I've, I've, I was sort of obsessed with the CIA for many years. I read so many books about them. I read, uh, that Chomsky book, how the world works, the, uh, overthrow by what's his name? Stephen Kinzer about like, just like over the U S overthrowing other governments. Uh, okay. Uh, Oh, uh, Jakarta method, that fucking book. Holy shit. What, what happened in Indonesia is completely wild. That'll um, definitely radicalize. I mean, it radicalized a lot of people in the sixties. I, sure. yeah, I can only imagine. Um, trying to find something relevant here. Uh, Oh, Wait, sorry. Hang and on. then just, yeah, whenever it finishes, we'll say goodbye and then off camera, we'll tie up administrative stuff. Cool. Sounds good. Oh, have you seen uh, um, Mick Lynch, the uh, uh, labor union guy in the uh, UK? No. Uh-huh. Man. Okay, hang on. This guy rules. Mick Lynch. 
I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but from what I've heard, it feels like the unions are opposing a degree of that modernisation and the railways desperately need it. But you don't need know it, that, do you? You haven't, um, you haven't well, I do know, their position. I, I, well, I do know a few things. You haven't one, one it, for example... I mean, the transport the, 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 couldn't well, discuss if, that Mick, if, if, if I could just finish for a second. You've lost 20% <laughs> so of the passengers on the railway since COVID. I haven't lost them. That's not COVID the fault did. of you and the rail industrial change. But we need to we encourage those people... We operated the trains all through that period. We need to encourage those people back. The worst way in which you can do that is by alienating your customers, by going on strike and making their lives much more difficult. <laughs> the worst way you could do it is insist that the fares go up by RPI, ripping off the commuters, but you won't give the, the workers RPI. The fares go up by RPI every year, the retail price index. That's the government regulations. Last year, profits were made by the train operators. £500 million out of that subsidy you gave went to those companies. <laughs> First group and go-ahead, who we're negotiating with, are both subject to takeovers from private, private equity companies. They're going to be worth billions because they know that you're going to keep siphoning money from the public purse into private but, sector operators, well, I, just as you're but, doing but, in but, health, what, what's education... What's actually happened in the care. last two years is... In effect, a large swathe the rails have been Actually, I've got to bring in So the idea that I've this is siphoning profits to the but private sector is made a hundred, hundred million pound of okay. profit. I've never heard such a load of nonsense all right. in all my life. It's just stuff that's spouted out and then repeated in the media. Well, if all you, this stuff I, I that you can't, offer you you can't talk to somebody. No, but I, offer you, th- I never tell you it's fact. That's why <laughs> I ask you, Mr. Lynch. Yeah, it's just nonsense. Nobody on the railway would recognise any of that. We've got guys out on the track working hard, welding rails, shoveling ballast, moving tons of gear around every day okay. like you would see on any building site they're totally committed to the industry we're in and they've got no interest in this kind of nonsense they tell us this nonsense you can't talk to a railway worker on their break absolute baloney and fantasy all this other stuff about spanish practices is a nonsense i've got members on strike today who deal with high technology that are out there they say there's no technology to inspect the tracks if you see any of the yellow trains out on the railway those are manned by rm team members called on train technicians that are dealing with new technology, advanced technology, digitalization every day of the week. I've got members out there operating. It makes uh, me laugh, honestly, that you have the hood as your profile pic, because that's a man who wreaked havoc on the world. Well, it makes me laugh that your level of journalism has descended so far that you can't think of any other question rather than a, a thing about put, the I didn't put that picture on your profile p- page. Yeah, but you've chosen to spend two or three minutes of this interview talking about an irrelevant. Because you seem so but irritated by the comparison. Going. Well, because you seem so irritated by the comparison to the I'm hood. not irritated at all. I'm completely... You seem very irritated. Well, I'm not. You're not? This is your non-irritated phase, is it? <laughs> What point are you trying to prove, Piers? I mean, I'm not trying to prove anything. You put it on your (laughs) Facebook page. I'm simply asking, it's an odd choice for a union boss who's about to go on. Wow. All right. (laughs) This guy, yeah? Oh, boy. Yeah, he's good. I um, I realized like halfway through because you said just another video of Mick Lynch bodying journalists and Tories. That wasn't even the, the one that I was watching. And I, was, I switched to the other one. It ended with uh, Piers Morgan, right? Yeah, talking about the profile. Yeah. Picture. Oh, yeah. my God. He's like, uh, yeah, the world's most evil vinyl puppet or whatever. <laughs> it's like, oh, look at that. Anyway, uh, oh, that I just good. found out about the, that guy a couple of days ago, but he fucking rules. Um, he's been on like so much British TV lately and he's always like <sighs> represents himself and his cause really well. Makes everybody else look very dumb. Yeah. He knows his shit. Mm-hmm. So what do you got um, coming up in the future? Well, I have a video coming out next month. I'm working on right now about uh, gender theory. So I've been like, uh, just reading a lot of, uh, Judith, Butler and Bell Hooks. I'm trying to do like a video that's like gender theory for dudes, for the boys uh, or whatever. Cause uh, I don't know. I feel like gender theory is like really interesting, but like dudes don't really read it that much. And uh, I feel like it's like, it's cool. It's like cool, like philosophy stuff. I got and, uh, something to throw your way for that. I'll, I'll see. Oh yeah. Yeah. So maybe it'll Please. help y'all. Yeah. Please uh, do. So it's a book um, called War and Gender. Oh, okay. That actually sounds very interesting because uh, um, yeah. I read this this book by uh, Bell Hooks. Um, what's it called? Uh, the Will to Change. And uh, in it, she talks about how like a lot of masculinity 
like our, our current like definition of what makes a man and like be a man is like also coincidentally or maybe not so coincidentally what makes a good soldier is like being able to cut off your you know your mind from feeling emotion and just like you know any emotion that isn't anger and you know being able to perform well as a soldier and like how people think about manliness is like he fought for his country and blah 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 and like this uh this really like harmful connection between patriarchy and imperialism and war and whatever yeah a lot of um, people want to go down like the evolutionary round and be like oh you know it's uh it's the hunter uh eh. I don't know if I buy it's the hunter. It's really the, and especially in our society, it's the warrior. It's the yes. military. Dude. Absolutely. And like early, like, you know, almost all people who are like, it's how our early ancestors were like. It's like, well, you don't know that. Like, no one knows anything about that. But there are reasons to believe that like early humans didn't do that much hunting. It was mostly eating, you know, berries and stuff and people are on like the i'm on the paleo diet it's like it's all meat it's like that's not really what we were eating eating back then no yeah that book there's so, so i sent you a link uh it'll i think it might help hey. your video a little so thank you i will definitely check this out how gender shapes the war system and vice versa fuck yeah okay i'm gonna check that out all right well i look forward to seeing that i'm gonna stop the recording anything else you want to say to the audience before you head out keep it real dandies you got a name for your audience you call them like actually the, that is, that's the name i call is them it dandies. yeah keep it real dandies <laughs> keep it cyber perfect all right <laughs> keep it real come lords oh shit <laughs>